Good evening, everyone. I think uh, it's preferred today today's presentation that we speak in English because we have our uh, dear uh, colleagues and members from the Ashley Society, uh, which I thank them all for their valuable attendance today. Um, we are going to start. Uh, First of all, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Shirif Omran. I'm the Ashley Pyramids Chapter Technology Transfer Chair. Uh, we want to start this presentation uh, with a brief video about the pyramids, which is our main uh, theme. So, uh, we will play a small video. mysterious wonders of the world, the Pyramids of Giza are an incredible sight to behold. The three Pyramids of Giza are the tombs of ancient Egyptian pharaohs. But you probably already knew that, so let's look at some of the other interesting facts about these fascinating structures. Thousands of years ago, Egypt was home to one of the largest and most powerful civilizations in the world. Their art and culture continues to fascinate people even today. And one of the most impressive legacies they left behind is the pyramids. The Great Pyramid of Giza is the only surviving wonder of the ancient world. And the complex of pyramids and other structures on the Giza Plateau near Cairo, Egypt, is a world heritage site for its importance to history. You might be surprised to learn that these famous pyramids are not the only pyramids in Egypt. In fact, there are more than a hundred of them, most much smaller than the Great Pyramid, and many very damaged. Ancient Egyptians believed that after death, people would continue to live very much like they had when they were alive. And so they buried people with things that they thought they would need. First, people were buried in the dry desert sand, but the graves were dug up by wild animals and people who wanted to steal the things they were buried with. Egyptians began to build flat tombs called mastabas out of mud bricks or stone. Then, about four and a half thousand years ago, an architect named Imhotep had the idea to build a stack of mastabas on top of each other each one smaller than the last. The result was what we call a step pyramid, a giant stairway meant to help the soul of the pharaoh climb into the heavens. So began a period of nearly a thousand years of pyramid building in Egypt. After the first step pyramids were constructed, a pharaoh named Snefru decided that he wanted a smooth-sided pyramid for his tomb. This proved difficult to accomplish, and Snefru had three pyramids built before he was satisfied. This third pyramid, the Red Pyramid, is believed to be the first true pyramid built in Egypt. The pharaoh who followed Snefru, Khufu, decided to build his own pyramid, bigger and better than the Red Pyramid. The result was the Great Pyramid of Giza, the largest pyramid ever built. Construction of the Great Pyramid likely took between 10 and 20 years. It was originally 481 feet or 146.5 meters high, making it the tallest man-made structure on Earth for nearly 4,000 years. The building of such an enormous pyramid was a monumental feat. 
People have wondered for thousands of years how it was possible to build something so huge with the technology available to the ancient Egyptians. The Great Pyramid is estimated to be made of 2.3 million blocks of stone. The largest of these blocks weigh between 25 and 80 metric tons and were transported for more than 500 miles or 800 kilometers away. The pyramid was originally encased in polished white limestone. Most of these stones have been removed over the millennia, meaning that when the pyramid was new, it would have looked very different than it does today. Khufu had other things built on the Giza Plateau, including two mortuary temples to honor him after his death, and three small pyramids for his wives to be buried in. The other two large pyramids on the Giza Plateau were built by Khufu's son, the pharaoh Khafre, and his grandson, the pharaoh Menkure. Khafre's pyramid complex includes a unique feature. The Great Sphinx, a huge guardian statue with the head of a man and the body of a lion. It is one of the oldest and largest statues in the world, measuring nearly 240 feet or 73 meters long from paw to tail, and 66 feet or 20 meters high. Deep inside the pyramids lay burial chambers for the pharaoh's body and any treasures and items they would need for the afterlife. Thank you, Jerry Muhammad uh, Ali, for this entertaining video. Uh, now I uh, want to start to uh, introduce uh, our dear uh, speaker, Mr. David Underwood. Um, I have a short bio about Mr. David. Uh, I think it's, it's a short one. <laughs> uh, let's say Mr. David Underwood has served actually for many years at the chapter, region, and society. He was a founder of Isosurf Engineering Limited and Evaporative Tower Service Incorporation in, in Ontario, Canada. He received the, his engineering degree from the University of Manitoba in 1964. Mr. Underwood is a fellow in ASHRI. He has received the Distinguished and Outstanding Service Awards and the William J. Collins Award. Mr. Underwood is a 2015-2016 Presidential Member. In his role on the Ontario Provincial Advisory Committee for the Certified Refrigeration Trade, he developed the trade examination and courses for refrigeration, apparatus, and consult a safety manual for refrigeration mechanics. For many years, Mr. Underwood has an active participant on the B52 Mechanical Refrigeration Code Committee for Canada. He also actively participated in developing the refrigerant management regulation for Ontario. Currently, he serves on the Model National Building Code Committee. Mr. Underwood has extensive experience in training operators and technicians through his role in commissioning systems as a primary function of our distinct design building uh, build firm. Mr. David Underwood is uh, Ashley Post President, Presidential Member and Distinguished Lecturer. Please, Mr. David. Thank you very much for that warm and welcoming introduction. My wife Jane and I are really pleased to be here in Egypt and we've been welcomed very, very nicely by, by you in hosting us. You've been doing a great job. I'd also like to congratulate you on establishing the inauguration of the Pyramids chapter. This is a feather in your cap and I'm sure you're going to be successful judging by the meeting last night. It was a wonderful, wonderful event and I'm sure you'll be very, very successful. 
And unfortunately, I didn't have my slides up that I really wanted in the first place, but this is my family. So excuse me, will I get myself to the right position here? This presentation identifies the tips, tricks, and techniques to successfully commission any project. Tips will cover how to proceed with planning, coordination, and training. Tricks will look at how to engage all participants in the project using effective human resources techniques. And techniques will look at some of the methods for performance verification and operator training and the use of ASHRAE guidelines, National Standard 202 on commissioning. The learning objectives include the application of commissioning procedures, the description of effective commissioning techniques, recognizing commissioning issues and discussing effective solutions, and defining roles and responsibilities of parties affected by the commissioning procedures. The ASHRAE definition of commissioning is a quality-focused process for enhancing the delivery of a project. Verification and documentation in all systems and assemblies are planned, designed and installed, tested, operated and maintained according to the owner's project requirements. After many years of field experience, I have a very simple definition of commissioning. It is the transfer of the designer's knowledge into the operator's hands. A stakeholder group uh, developed this strategic guide to commissioning, and the guide gives a unified industry definition. The guide identifies the types of systems that may require commissioning, people that may be affected by the commissioned systems, a roadmap to achieving a properly commissioned facility, the values and benefits of commissioning, the performance requirements, and the characteristic of teams. The Building Performance Alliance included many associations and groups active in the commissioning services. It gives a broad scope for owners to understand the industry focus on project commissioning. The Strategic Guide to Commissioning is available for free download at the ASHRAE website. As a first tip, I cannot overemphasize, start as early as possible in the building process, ideally with the project owner or the developer. This value is emphasized as the first activity in ASHRAE Standard 202. Remember, the commissioning authority has direct responsibility to the owner. And finally, it is always best to have the commissioning contract signed with the owner. The greatest trick to successful commissioning is establishing early communications between all parties. And that is developing good interper interpersonal relationships with all the participants of a project. ASHRAE has developed a series of excellent documents for guidance in the techniques of the commissioning process. As you can see, ASHRAE has actively pursued various activities in commissioning. Guidelines 0 and 0 0.2 offer approaches to complete commissioning for new and existing facilities. Guideline 1.1 sets up the technical requirements for HVAC and R systems, which is particularly useful for those of us in this room. Guideline 1.4 addresses the essentials for a systems manual. And Guideline 1.5 is specific to smoke control systems. Commissioning procedures may be applied to any building system, including envelopes, emergency management systems, etc. If many different systems are commissioned, a commissioning uh, management professional is needed for coordination of project. All ASHRAE standards have a title, purpose, and a scope. The purpose of standard 202 is to identify the minimum acceptable commissioning process for the building systems. 
The scope provides procedures, methods, and documentation requirements for project delivery, from pre-design through occupancy and operations, including an overview of the commissioning process, the description of each step's minimum activities, the minimum documentation requirements, and the acceptance requirements. Standard 202 has a number of informative appendices for assisting in meeting the requirements of this standard. And the standard sets out minimum requirements, but it is, it is acceptable to provide additional measures beyond the minimum should the project demand them. A commission project assures the owner's project requirements or the OPR are met. The constructability of the systems and the ability to operate and maintain the facility. The education and training of the operators which leads to lower operation and maintenance costs with fewer occupant complaints. This graph shows the results from a study done by the U.S. The federal government about its own buildings. They found that approximately 95% of the cost of owning a building is associated with maintenance, operation, insurance, and financing. Which means only 5% of the cost of owning a, owning a building results from its construction. Ironically, as many of us in the room know, when owners want to reduce their costs, they usually reduce construction expenses first. The graph illustrates that reducing the costs of construction will have minimal impact on ownership over the life of the building. And commissioning will assure least cost operation and maintenance of the facility. One thing I really like about commissioning, it ties together the owner, the designer, the constructor, and the operation and maintenance staff in an effort to provide a sustainable and successful project. This string that leads through the commissioning process is very effective, as, it's, as I've just said, because it ties everybody together, and the commissioning authority has to establish interpersonal relationships with all of those participants. The commissioning team depends on the size, type, and complexity of a project. It may require the services of an ASHA certified commissioning process manager, or CPMP, or other related professional qualifications. These management uh, abilities apply to large facilities with many systems to be commissioned, such as in a hospital. The CPMP has a role to manage the procedures of all commissioned systems. They may not have expertise in each one of them, but they're the manager of, of that project. However, if the owner needs only the, the commissioning of one or two systems, a commissioning authority, is, as opposed to a management professional, who is versed in those systems may do that work. This would typically apply to a small commercial project where you're commissioning only the HVAC and R systems. The owner receives value from the commissioning project through a comprehensive startup instructions including appropriate operation and maintenance staff training, detailed operation and maintenance information that is project specific that is, using a systems approach. And you'll get seasonal performance checks with additional operator interfaces. This leads to a reduction of callbacks and warranty problems. For successfully commissioning a project, the owner should select the commissioning team and ideally contract directly with that team. The commissioning team advocates for the owner throughout the construction and occupancy phases of the project. The commissioning authority directs the development of that commissioning process. The owner identifies the systems and assemblies to be included. Then the owner works with the commissioner to develop the project contract which, which uh, clarifies its activities, roles, and responsibilities. Throughout the commissioning process, the owner uh, period periodically reviews the completed work and proposed modifications. In the most successful commissioning project, the commissioner begins to work with the owner very early in the planning stages of the project. The details of any OPR should include the operator skill level that the owner expects for the project, which will influence the basis of design to allow effective system operations. 
This looks at the anticipated building uses, the appropriate design standards, and the local code requirements. Also, the type of construction techniques used. Will it be a design, bid, build, which normally is traditional, certainly in North America. Will it be an integrated design, which includes all the project participants? Or will it be a design build project, which meets the OPR? I'm going to digress slightly here. Whenever I have the opportunity to speak to an owner about you know, putting together a commissioning process, one of the very first questions I will ask that owner, who is going to run your building? Because if you're going to use the janitor to run your building, don't make it complicated. Because if you do, you're going to lead yourself to failure. The OPR is a living document which will be adjusted by the owner during the life of the project based on the following. Changes to the facility objectives, like adding a computer center, or changes in operational hours due to the type of occupancy. Environmental and efficiency goals of the project. The indoor environmental quality requirements. The commissioning process and its scope. The systems and the equipment access and the system's manual requirements. The commissioning team shall review and report all changes to the OPR for the approval of the owners in the course of the project. The skills of the commissioning authority include the knowledge regarding the systems and design development to serve the OPR and understand the designer's approach to the project. Extensive construction experience to understand the techniques required for an efficient and timely installation, and information on the skill levels required for the operation staff or the proposed system. The OPR details may be affected by using codes and standards that apply to the location of the project, the specific project requirements which may be beyond standard design protocol, the training for the operations and personnel, as well as the tenants of the building and the schedules dictated by the project's urgency. For example, in many cases, I've run into the school boards where they say they require commissioning of a project. And it's a great idea, and they call us up, usually in around June, the school is opening in September. It has been designed, mainly constructed, and at that stage, the only thing you can do is actually a performance verification of the systems as they are installed and possibly do a little bit of training of usually the janitor who's going to look after that school. To commission a project, the minimum documents required are the owner's project requirements of the OPR, the basis of design or the BOD, the issues and resolutions log through the course of the construction, the commissioning process reports, and the system's manual. A successful commissioning process requires planning, which includes starting as early as possible, which I mentioned before, and even prior to engaging the design professionals. The commission works, and the commissioner works with the owner's project team, planning the systems to be commissioned, and designing a roadmap of procedures for the project. Identifying what systems and assemblies are most critical to the project's success and deciding the performance and acceptance criteria of those systems during performance verification. The commission plan details the responsibilities of all the team members. And the commission team includes all of the project participants. The owner, the designer, the constructor, and the operations and maintenance staff. The commissioning plan also includes the documents indicating the roles and responsibilities of the commissioning authority and all the other project participants. The commissioning process and the tentative schedule for the project. The project design milestones and the basis of design document requirements. And the verification procedures of systems to be commissioned with project specific checklists and how to address any OPR deviation during the, uh, the completion of the project. The commissioning plan is to be approved by the owner. The final detail of the commissioning plan shall be part of the commissioning process report. 
The basis of design or BOD is developed by the systems designer and include the details of the design procedures and processes to meet the OPR, the details of the design issues that deviate from the OPR, and the owner's approval of design for compliance with the OPR. The basis of design or BOD will be a written document for review by the owner and the commissioning authority for compliance with that OPR. The critical elements of the basis of design include defining the milestones for submittals of design presentation with the consideration of design alternatives at each of the phases. The required detailed design approaches to meet the OPR again in a written document. It details the stages of design review prior to tender, provides for coordination of technical and code requirements, and the commissioning authority will have checking design for OPR compliance, looks for details allowing commissioning and room to operate and maintain those systems. And a log is kept of all design changes which may affect the OPR. However, I would like to emphasize this. Under no circumstances does the commissioning authority make design decisions. They may be asked for their opinion, but they do not make those decisions. That is up to the designer. The commissioning authority assesses the basis of design for compliance to the LPR throughout the various design stages and informs the owner of any changes that may be needed. The owner accepts or changes the OPR or the basis of design during design, the design process to comply with the necessary design decisions that have been made and the owner approves the commissioning authority's review report and the design team's response before start of construction. It's a whole lot easier to change things on AutoCAD than it is to try and change the bricks and mortar once they have been built. The commissioning specification will include the commissioning process activities which the contractor will perform during the construction phases, the commissioning authority is to verify the validity of systems performance testing and general conditions define the roles of all parties to the process and describes the testing for systems and assemblies based on the OPR and the basis of design. The commissioning specifications will be part of the project specification so they can be priced into the contract price. During the construction, the commissioning authority sells the commissioning process, particularly if it has not been used before. This is where interpersonal skills really, really help. Submittals are reviewed prior to construction. The commissioning report will include the date of the review, the detailed specifications, the verification that equipment complies with specifications, and the summary of equipment and systems not in compliance with LPR. And here I'll deviate again a little bit. I'd like to tell you about one of the hospital projects we did in Toronto. During review of the equipment submittals, we saw the contract proposal for two cooling towers instead of one, which significantly reduced the equipment costs, which that the, the mechanical contractor reported to the owner. Now through the, the submittal procedures, of course, the owner accepted that, uh, you know, that reduction in the equipment cost because he thought it was going to help him you know, on the project. The difficulty was that when we looked at the, at the uh, submittal drawings, you know, well, they were approved by the uh, designer because they met the, you know, they met the needs of the design, uh, the design as it was uh, constructed. It had two problems. Problem number one, the logistics of getting into a downtown hospital in a very busy city. I'm sure it would be much more difficult in Cairo than it is in Toronto. It was going to cost a lot more money because of crane operation, uh, crane operators twice on two different nights because you had to do all this work after midnight. And secondly, we found that the structural system was not adequate to handle the two cooling towers. This is where, as a civil engineer, <coughs> I had some input to the whole procedure. As it turned out, the, also, it was not a constructible job because it, it was not accessible to run it properly and to maintain those towers because there just was not enough room. So in the end, they decided to go back to the original design and not accept 
that it's a supposed reduction in cost because of the other costs that were going to be ensued upon it, it would have actually cost the, you know, the owner more. However, the commissioning responsibility <laughs> of looking at those at the, the submittal drawings is not to replace the engineer's design review or equipment compliance with the contract documents. <clears throat> The systems and performance verification testing and it will be observed by the commissioning authority and will include the job specific protocols for systems and assemblies, including long term data that is necessary to be collected. When the test reports, failed tests will be repeated as per the commissioning specifications. However, only spot verification will be performed on multiple <coughs> similar elements, like diffusers or uh, mixing boxes, etc., with established failure rates shown in the specifications. Failure rates in excess of those specifications must be corrected and retested. The verification reporting system includes a summary of test results presented to the owner prior to inclusion in the commissioning process report. All systems verification reports are included in that final commissioning process report. The system test reports that are outside the protocol are reported to the contractor for their remedy. And failed tests, however, are also included in the issues and resolutions log. The issues and resolutions report and log records the site problems as they occur and are, are prepared as follows. The commissioning authority and the commission team develop a project-specific form and the issues are noted including the parties responsible for the resolution and the date of completion of that resolution. The owner reviews and accepts the issues and resolutions report, which is included again in the commission process report. The issues and resolutions report keeps track of construction issues as they occur. It gives the contractor a roadmap to reduce the final punch list developed by the design team. And that reduced punch list results in earlier substantial completion and final project payment. The contractors love it. And a reduction in callbacks because of verification of systems and warranty problems for the contractor. Our experience has shown us that reduced time to project completion and the reduced warranty cost for systems performance verification is of great value to the contracting industry. Now I'll go back to the original stuff I was talking about in terms of uh, working with the commission with interpersonal skills. One of the very first commission jobs we did, which a number of years ago, was with the contractor. And he was very opposed, he thought it was just an additional cost to the contract that he did not want to bear. And going through the issues and resolutions log and, and the details of, I've given here on looking at the, at the construction project, he found that that reduction in time, you know, the completion because we worked with them, and the reduction in, in warranty costs because of system performance verification more than justified the expense of the commission. So he became one of our greatest salespeople in the commission world in the city of Toronto. The systems manual provides the operations personnel with project specific documentation, the details of how the commission systems will operate and how to appropriately maintain them. After the OPR, the systems manual is probably the most valuable document prepared under the commissioning process. The systems manual's objective is to provide all necessary information for operating the operating staff to understand how to operate the facility. All building design, construction, and testing results in one document. A source for training materials. And information for performance improvement during ongoing commissioning. The sections of the systems manual include the executive summary, the facility design and construction, the building systems and assembly information, the facility operations, the training requirements, and the commissioning process report. Details for these sections may be found in the appendices of ASHRAE Standard 202 on commissioning. Sections two through four 
are used to prepare training for the O&M personnel. And the owner shall approve the final systems manual for use by the facility's staff. The training section is often referred to because it is an ongoing process at any facility. And this section details the learning objectives to be achieved, the instructor's qualifications for the owner's approval, the training materials that are appropriate for that project, and the methods to be employed including audio and visual recording of the training procedures, the training location, the duration of that training, training and the total hours required and the reports and records to be archived for future reference. Training and op of operation and maintenance staff need to use the principles of adult learning, have a detailed lesson plan, and use the systems manual as the basic tool for developing this plan. <laughs> Record the lesson procedures including lecture and hands-on activity for future reference, and schedule refresher courses. And we always use a video recording of class learning and hands-on learning, which are very useful for future reference. Beginning at substantial completion of the commission, the commissioning authority conducts seasonal performance activities with the responsible parties. And this ensures ongoing training of the operation and maintenance personnel during those seasonal checks. The Commission Authority during those, that procedure also observes any warranty actions which will be directed by the general uh, contractor or the project manager. The final commissioning report shall include an executive summary, the commission process plans, design and submittal review reports, the approved commissioning authority evaluations and commissioning startup test forms, the commissioning process reports, the issues and resolutions log for all incomplete issues identify those responsible parties and the completion. At the conclusion of the first year of operation and post-occupancy work, the Commission Authority submits all documents to the owner, including the final OPR for the project, the final basis of design documents, the issues and resolutions log, the Commission re Process Report, and most importantly, the systems manual. In conclusion, who benefits? The owner has a project which meets his OPR or her OPRs or the designer has detailed instructions for development of the project's basis of design. The constructor has coordination assistance, lines of communication, earlier completion, and reduced warranty costs. The operation and maintenance personnel have clear instructions regarding the building's operation. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Are there any questions or shall I even ask for any comments? Yes, sir. Oops. Yes, sir. I see you back there. You give me a mic. Okay. Thank you for the great lecture. Uh, what you are simply explaining is normally here in Egypt, uh, at least, is done by a consultant uh, during construction supervision phase. So, uh, what you mean by commissioning party is just uh, another consultant, different than the designer, is to carry out this task. Is this the result? It's just a consultant? Well, let me uh, give you a little bit of the history of why ASHA got into, you know, into this in the first place. Years ago, when I first entered this industry, which you saw in my introduction a long, long time ago, the designer was paid significant fees so they could actually do this work you know, on behalf of the owner. Over time, particularly in North America, where, where it first happened was in the first oil crisis in the mid-70s. Everybody started to cut back on how much they paid for the construction first thing that went were the designer's fees. So they no longer had enough income to do the work that is, you know, in, in, you know, in, entailed in, in the commissioning process. 
And then the general contractor said, well, I can take that over. And of course, you know, further you know, reductions came along. He said, no, no, I don't have to do that anymore. And finally, the owners were getting you know, a building that was not functional. They weren't working properly. And they came to Asheray and said, we need help. And that's when we started to design. There's the mid-80s, we started to look at the commissioning procedures. And that's when we started to develop this documentation on behalf of the owners. And so it has become, you know, pretty uh, normal in North America, particularly that the, you know the designers are getting, you know, still getting those low fees, so they're not willing to do this work. And in the end, what has happened? It really is, is a quality assurance of construction, which was missing in the whole of the system. So that the owner thought he was getting a good building, but everybody was trying to cut the corners. In the end, you got a building that was not functional. And, and with tying everybody <clears throat> together during the commissioning procedures, you've got the owner, you the designer, the constructor, and the operating, operation and maintenance people under the aegis of one party. And you know, the contract, if it's signed with the owner, you're working for the owner. And there's always a question. If you're signed that, you know, the, the, one of the <coughs> participants to the procedure is doing that work, are they you know, covering themselves or not, whereas, you know, the independence of a commissioning authority is valuable to the owner. And that's where, you know, why it developed in that way, certainly in North America. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, I mean, not exactly. Okay. <laughs> what I mean is, uh, you, 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 you actually didn't include any kind of testing procedure using tools. Like uh, it's it's just a procedure. It's it's a supervision and procedure and documentation. It's not including actual testing like validation or something like this. Well, what what again? I did, I didn't go into those details because I didn't. You did it being about a you know three day lecture. What you look at each pro each project is different, as you know. They're all unique, and so what you want to do uh, for each job is the commissioning authority will design the, the details for the performance verification of the systems in the buildings. And this is not looking at equipment startup, this is looking at system performance. Does the system perform the way the designer wanted it to in the first place, and the designer has put the design together to meet what the owner wants in terms of his OPR. I'm sorry, so those so things are very specific, they have to be very specific, but they're, because they're unique to each job, it's really hard to give a lecture on that, you know, on those details. Yes, but you mentioned clearly that uh, the commissioning party is not is not uh, going to discuss design or redesign, it's, uh, it's following the, the original design. That's correct. They are, they are the owner's ears and eyes on the project. Okay. The owner can do this kind of work themselves, they wish to, and some do. We only face this here in Egypt whenever you have like a struggle between contractor and consultant and you, you hire a third party to do this commissioning to, to judge between them during this struggle. This is the normal, uh, I mean, this is the only case I've, I have ever heard about something like this here in Egypt. A commissioning third party, what I mean. I mean the commissioner is a third party, but the, the third party on the basis, or on, on, you know, you know, representing the owner. <clears throat> you know, when you're, you're, what you're looking at is, is a, an argument, you know, a contract argument, really between the, the designer and the contractor, and that's not really the, you know, the purpose of commissioning. The purpose of commissioning is to tie things together, and if you get into those kinds of detailed arguments, you're looking at the legal side of what's happening as opposed to actually trying to make the commission, you know, the commission job functional for, uh, for the owner's benefit. Okay, thank you. I, I know I didn't answer your question directly, but that's generally how it's done at the end in North America. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jameson. Any other questions? Thank you for your presentation, sir. My question is, how much would be the cost of the commissioning procedure compared to the cost of the design and the construction? Uh, it's a lot less. And I know there's... You get asked this question all the time. It's a, a lot dependent on the complexity of the project. If you've got a hospital with many systems to be commissioned, it's obviously going to be more expensive. If you've got a, you know, maybe a, uh, you know, a 5,000 uh, square meter building, it's going to be a lot cheaper. So they range in, in price usually from one to three percent. One to two. One to two. One to three. Okay. 
at how the whole project cost. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gifford. Uh, any other questions? Mohammed Ibrahim, Ashley, regional branch. Uh, two questions, actually. First question, Ashley, they have a certification of commissioning. If you can enlighten us in that certification, what is the requirement and how we can approach it? Uh, the second question is, uh, in many projects, I found always in the commissioning that is the parameter what we have. It is totally, it's not totally <laughs> variance than the design parameters. And we find the uh, best point of the accurate point of gradient system as a pressure of, as the uh, flow is a little bit away from the design. Even with the whole technology of modeling and simulation and what the hard work the designer looks still we find in the commission, these parameters keep away from the after the commissioning from the design itself. What is the reason this uh, efficiency of the design or what is that? No, Hannah, the second question is more difficult than the first. So, the, to your first question, uh, the Commission Process Management Professional Certification is a certification that looks at general knowledge in the construction industry, how things are designed, how things are built, and how they are operated and maintained. We look for a broad knowledge. It's not a specific course. It's a question of knowing how construction works, having a great deal of experience in the construction world so you can understand those things that are going to occur during any project. As to your second question, part of why it works and is successful is if you do it well, you've got the owner's project requirements, you're talking to the engineer about the basis of design, and all of those sorts of its milestones, its approval process, in the end, the owner accepts the basis of design, but because you've got a commissioner involved in it, they look at the constructability and the maintainability of the systems that are being, uh, you know, being uh, recommended. So if you do that procedure well, a lot of what you're talking about, you know, in terms of the, you know, the, the questions between the construction side and the design side, get answered before you actually get into the problem. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, here we should uh, normally have the commission start at the, at the end of the project. And uh, rather difficult here, they are, it's, it's paid by the contractor, not by the owner, which is another, another issue. Uh, the commission, uh, in my opinion, it should start from the start of the uh, construction. Yes, he has to review. He has to view all the shop drawings prepared by the contractor to identify whether he is requiring any location for test points, then access in the ceiling, uh, if they need to add some more uh, dampers or uh, test point or valves or whatever for the proper uh, commission. And he certify or approve the shop drawing prior to the consultant approval. And then at the end of the project, he start. Uh, this is what, 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 what I, I, I see it, uh, the proper way uh, for testing and commissioning. And, and, yeah, in, in, in my experience with, with, with what you're talking about, if you work with the owner, you work with the designer, so you know what the systems are expected for that job. When we work with a general contractor or project manager, one of the things that we always do is we work very closely with them, you know, with all the trades on the job. And we'll maybe do the interference drawings and that sort of thing to try and speed up the construction so that the sheet metal guy and the plumber and the electrician and all the various parties to a project are not stumbling over each other or going on the job. Like contractors love to get in and get their work done because they think they're going to get paid before everybody else. So you look at how the thing goes together both from the point of view of an efficient installation of that construction and speeding it up, but also is it going to be serviceable and maintainable after the job is completed. And that often gets forgotten. And I think that's one of the most important things about the commission you know, of any project, 
is you're looking at is this building going to be able to be operated properly and is it going to be able to be maintained well? I mean, this objective should be determined before we start the construction. Absolutely. Right. So we have to choose the commissioning team and the commissioning authority beforehand, before we even go to the site. This is uh, uh, as a team uh, representing the owner and he look at the design and see if the design will fulfill all the requirements of the owner project requirement. And then if there is any differences, he should resolve this issue before we go to it. Is that right? That is correct. So far you're giving my lecture. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. If that could be a part of the uh, project management company? Yes, it could be. Uh, okay. But project managers, generally speaking, in my experience, don't always know a lot about construction. And that's where you run into big difficulties. Because they, they're there you know, to be a manager of a group of people. And if they don't really understand what they're, what they're managing, you can get into big problems. And that's why I, I suggested that the commissioning authority or commissioning team have to have a lot of construction experience, a lot of design experience, and a lot of operations experience. So if you don't have somebody that has all those qualifications, I think you're leading yourself to failure. Oh. <laughs> and believe me, I've seen a lot of jobs that fail. <laughs> Uh, I think we give you lots of questions. <laughs> so I, I, I really would like to thank you very much for this uh, valuable presentation and for your time and everything and this valuable knowledge. Uh, uh, we have, uh, after the coffee break, a very exciting lecture about the future of our industry. Uh, I'm really also excited uh, to be. But now we'll give you a very short break for 10 minutes, so we just, we just don't waste more time. Just 10 minutes, coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.